ready to go? No, no, you're not late at all. If anything, we are both a bit early. The caravan won't leave for a few more hours, I think. Half the merchants aren't even here yet. Yes, there will be more than twenty of us in the caravan. Quite a lot of people and carriages. Safety in numbers and all that. This is the last big caravan crossing the desert this season. And uh, it's time to go south for me. I need new stock and new customers. Besides, a traveling bookseller has a certain mystique that a stationary bookstore doesn't. People know I won't stick around forever, so they have to hurry up and buy that ancient scroll or rare manuscript while they still have the chance. This is my cart, right here. Yes, crammed full of books and scrolls, as you might expect. I left you a little copy in there to put your things and as a place to sleep. Mine is further to the front. The horses are Rustler and Woodsmoke. They are desert horses, and bred for the heat. Calm and experienced, and not easily spooked. Most of the others have horses as well, but some have one horns. Big, heavy beasts. You must have seen them in the city sometimes. Yes. They're the ones that look like something between a rhinoceros and a workhorse. And with a curved horn on their forehead. Incredibly strong, but slow and lumbering. And they need more food and water than the horses. They can carry heavy loads, though. And the burned ones tend to be afraid of them. So it's always safer to bring at least a couple. I'm glad you took me up on my offer. It's nice to share my cart with someone. Having someone to chat with while we're on the road. Crossing will take about ten days if we don't run into trouble. I wouldn't say I expect trouble, no. But it's best to be prepared for anything when you cross. How long have you lived in Anessa? And just a couple of months? You're still a newcomer to the city, then. That explains why you didn't recognize the one horns. They mostly come in with the caravans. They're kept and bred on the other side of the desert, not here. You came here to study, right? What are you studying? History. The past contains so many mysteries. This land is ancient, but we don't really know that much about those who came before us. Records only go back about 500 years. If you want to go further back than that, it's archaeology or myth. You can't be more than halfway through your first semester. Why cross the desert now? You won't be able to return 
for months. Is the university not for you? It's okay. You don't have to tell me. You're welcome to travel around the south with me, if you want. I could use an assistant. I'm glad you dropped by my market stand the other day. Must have been, what, two years since I last saw you? Not since the last time I went up north to Lantar. We could easily have missed each other completely. Yes, I'm... I'm glad of your company. So, how much do you actually know of the desert? When you live in Onessa, you tend to pick up a thing or two. But since you haven't been here all that long, and you must have been busy with your studies, well, I'm only asking because the desert is not a friendly place. And if you don't know what you should bring, we still have the time to remedy that and do a bit of shopping before the caravan leaves. Other northerners visiting Anessa for the first time find the desert exotic. Sometimes they travel into the desert to spend the night <laughs> camping without a clue what it's like. Few of them return and the city don't send out any search parties either. If you enter the desert, you're on your own. Oh, don't worry. We'll be perfectly safe in the caravan. You see the guy in the colorful robe over there? That's Bruno Savan, the caravan leader. He's been guiding people across the desert for nigh on 20 years, makes a fortune off of it. He knows what he's doing. He has plenty of security measures, including magic wards, and he brings his own wizard. It's not cheap, securing a spot on one of his caravans, but you get what you pay for. It doesn't hurt to be well prepared though, so if you don't mind, I could take a look at what you've packed. Okay. You brought two big water skins. One is enough. You can fill it from my own water barrel in the carriage. Don't worry about water. The caravan provides. There are wells that Bruno's wizard draws from at the rest stops along the way. But if something happens, we need to have a few days supply for ourselves. That's what the barrel is for. You should have a small supply of filter potions, in case we need to find our own water in the desert. It will clean any dirty water we might find, and make it safe to drink. Herbologists sell it. No point in bringing your own water skin if... Um, if the water you collect in it will kill you. May I take a look at your clothes as well? You need clothes that are light in color and airy. 
The sun is ruthless enough without dark clothing making it worse. You have that, good. You won't be wearing this jacket in the daytime. It's far too thick. It's good for nights though. The desert gets cold after the sun sets. But for the daytime, you need light and airy pants and shirts, but long-sleeved, not these. You have to protect your arms from the sun. This wide-brimmed hat is good, but you should have a big shawl to cover your head and neck for when it gets windy. You need to protect your face from the sand when the wind is blowing. A hat won't do that. What's this? You brought a book? Let me see. Songs from the Valley of Thorns by Valianti. A classic. I didn't know you read poetry. I like Valianti. Um, let me take a look at your footwear as well. Your boots seem sturdy and well-worn. That's good. In case we do have to track on foot for whatever reason. You don't want new boots that's not worn in and ends up chafing you. And you have a knife in your belt. Yes, that's a must. Always bring a knife. Have you got any oil? N no, for your skin. To protect it from the heat. And from drying out. It will prevent sunburns. And you can go a bit longer without needing water when you use it. Herbologists sell that as well. There are also a few magical trinkets that I would strongly recommend that you bring with you. I have a water compass, but that's very expensive and will only need one if we get lost anyway. But you should get a tracking stone. You know, the ones that come in pairs, magically connected, and one will always glow faintly when you move it towards the other one. You should get a couple of those. We can each have one. We can locate each other easily, then, if we get separated. Bruno's wizard sets up a protective perimeter around camp every night, and there are the one horns, but I still think you should get a protective amulet as well. They can be a bit pricey, but uh, go to Alacor's Trinkets. Do you know that shop? Just on a market corner. They sell used ones much cheaper, and they work just as well. The burned ones seek the living of the dark, and such an amulet will keep them at bay. Works on other cursed creatures as well. Not all, but most. Bruno has a small stock too, but it's better to buy them here in the city. Once we leave, Bruno's the only one you can buy those things from, and he knows it. Save yourself some gold and 
get them before we depart. You should be able to get everything at the market if you hurry. Do you remember everything? Some light and airy long-sleeved linen shirts, a big white shawl, filter potions, at least five of them, sun oil, the protective amulet, and the tracking stones. We have been chit-chatting for a while, so hurry off and make sure to be back in no more than an hour. If you can't get everything by then, you'll have to buy from Bruno at triple the price. Go on, get going. See you back here in a bit. This is not the desert. I mean, not the desert proper. We're still in the outskirts. That's why there's bird song and gnarly little trees and those cacti everywhere. The cacti grow these big red flowers in spring and everything looks so lush. Another day or so, and we'll be surrounded by nothing but sand. It's a bit like an ocean, really. Like Ravani, the river hopper, wrote in her autobiography. Have you read it? You should. It's a marvelous read. She crossed the desert more than 50 times explored it more than anyone else has, and vanished there, in the end. Her autobiography was the only thing she ever wrote, a beautiful work. Her paragraphs ebbs and flow. They have this internal rhythm that I haven't encountered in any other writer. She described so many places in the desert, but only a few of them have been located by others. People think she made most of it up. She tells of ancient ruins that are all but swallowed by the dunes, monoliths with inscriptions in a language no one can read anymore. Ancient magic that keeps oasis alive amidst the arid sand, hidden away and full of secrets. Her book has such a strong sense of place, it inspired me to do my first crossing. Before I read it, I never thought I would leave the north. Ravani calls the desert a glittering ocean of sand, and the dunes are the waves, ever changing and not a drop to drink, on the surface at least. I'm inclined to believe Ravani, she might have exaggerated a little on occasion. But there's plenty of magic at work in this place, and it must have been inhabited at some point. Not too far-fetched to imagine that there might be ancient ruins somewhere. There's the road, for starters, and the rest stops, 
and the wells. We don't know how old any of it is, or who built it, but they must have been made using a great deal of magic. The water that can be drawn from the wells is very, very deep down. No one could have built those wells today. And the road itself, somehow the sand never completely covers it. And I suspect there's some ancient magic in that too. Who builds a brick road through a desert? And how? The sand moves. The ground is not stable. The road itself can be hard to find in places. You still need a guide to make sure you don't stray from it. Maybe it was different when it was new, when its magic was stronger, and perhaps better maintained. Sometimes a carriage gets stuck in the sand that has blown over it. In that case, we help each other out. Someone else's horse or one horn will add the extra strength needed to pull us loose, should we need it. And we might return the favor if someone else gets stuck. But it delays us sometimes, and we end up behind schedule. The rest stops are the safest place to spend the night. That's when they come out, the burned ones. So it's best to reach your rest stop before dark. And they are far apart, some further than others. You have heard of them, right? The burned ones. Oh, I can assure you they are very real. You might see them tonight, if we are delayed on the road. They look like burnt corpses, with bodies that flake and smolder. Their eyes glow orange, and they groan like... like they have borne the pain of their burning for a very long time. They are slow, but they will come for you, relentlessly if nothing stops them. What stops them? The one horn scares them. Magic wards and amulets work, although wards are the better of the two, and they usually stay away from the rest stops. Other than that, the sun. They bury themselves in the sand, when the sun rises. There are many stories about them. Some believe they are the original inhabitants of the desert, that they are suffering from some kind of curse. Others believe that this is what happens to those who die in the desert. Maybe both are true, maybe neither. But the desert is full of old magic, slowly waning away, and unlike anything we can achieve today. I think the desert used to be a very different place. Something big must have happened here, long ago, to change it. So distant in time, that it has faded from collective memory. We might find scraps of old truths in myth and fairy tales. And the desert will not give up its secrets easily, if the burned ones are anything to go by.
There are some commonalities in the supernatural phenomenon and magical creatures encountered in the desert. The few who have strayed from the road and survived have told tales of creatures with telepathic abilities, unknown entities that bend your will, blinds you, tricks you, spins illusions, makes you think you're somewhere else entirely. The University of Ithera is studying it. They have greatly expanded the Midway Rest Stop. It's almost a small town now. Landsong, it's called. And it has palm trees. Water drawn from the well continuously. Food vendors and even an inn. All expensive though. Vitheran mages have done a lot of work at Landsong. The idea is to recreate how one imagines that the rest stops used to be once. It's a permanent outpost of the university and they use it as a base to explore the desert. So far, they keep most of their findings to themselves. But tonight, we will rest at a regular rest stop. Unless one of us gets stuck in the sand, that is. Each night, when we reach the rest stop, we place all the carriages in a wide circle around the well with the back of each carriage facing outwards and the animals in the middle. Bruno's wizard then draws up wards all around us. When the entire caravan is well protected, he draws water from the well in the middle. While he does all of this, we take care of the animals release them from their harness, brush them, clean their hooves. We take care of them before we take care of ourselves, always. When the water is drawn, we water the horses, then fill our own storage, the barrel in the back in my case. Then we can wash and drink and eat. But for now, take a look at Ravani's autobiography. There's something in it I'd like to discuss with you a little later. You'll like it, I think. It's good, isn't it? Are you sure you don't want another helping? During the day, the heat is so brutal, you feel like you'd never want a warm meal again. But at night, when the sun has set and the air is chilly and you wash the day's dust off of you, one of Bruno's stews really hits the spot. And there's plenty of food. Bruno's two carriages carry nothing but food. For us and the animals. And a few trinkets for survival. Should someone lack them. Mm. It's a nice night. Almost no wind. Calm, clear skies, filled with stars. I always like the desert night, best part of the crossing, as long as you're safe at the rest stop.
I can see a few familiar faces here and there. People I've crossed with before. The woman in the green knitted shawl. She is Bernice Lenar, an alchemist. Travels now and then to collect rare ingredients. No, she doesn't peddle them, as far as I know. She teaches alchemy. At your university, in fact. But a different faculty, I guess. Hey Bernice, good to see you. Hm. A nod and a wave. She mostly keeps to herself. And those two. Yes, they are twins. Willimar and Alaric of Demmer. Master smiths, one a blacksmith and the other a silversmith. They live in the north, but but they tend to spend part of the winter in the south. A family in both places. And the one in the carriage right next to us, he's known as the dragon merchant. Yes, the one with the hookah. I don't know his real name. He's a very private person. Uh, No, he doesn't keep to himself like Bernice. He's very social, interested in people. But he doesn't divulge a lot about himself. He's a leather worker, I think. Makes armor and equipment for adventurers. His shop seems to always have exactly what you're looking for. He travels a lot. Like me. And our paths cross now and then. We've talked many times. And I feel like I know him quite well. But at the same time, not at all. And he does have a way of knowing when someone is talking about him. Here he comes. Good evening to you. Good evening, fellow traveler. Haven't seen you in a while. Nor I you. And I see you have a new companion. An apprentice, perhaps? Um, no, this is my friend from Lantar. A student of history at the University of Anessa. Taking a long break from their studies. To think things through. And perhaps choose a different path. Ah, I see. Will you remain in the south for the winter? I, um, haven't decided yet. Depends on what conditions are like in the south. When I last left, there were book burnings and talk of witch hunts. Yes, after two bad harvests in a row, people are looking for scapegoats. I would stick to the larger cities if I were you, where people are more used to foreigners and strangers. It might be safer for you, and you shouldn't travel alone. I'll keep that in mind. Have you walked the perimeter again? Indeed I have. On these crossings it has become a reassuring habit. Anything unusual? No, not as far as I could see. Just the usual handful of burned ones, watching us from across the magic wards. Your friend might want to take a look at them, just out of curiosity. They are certainly keeping a close eye on us. But the wards keep them at bay. And they'll be gone as soon as the sun breaches the horizon. 
we are well protected here. And I will make my rounds now and then, just in case. That is good to know. Have a good night, then. And the same to you. Sometimes I wonder if he actually is Dragonkin. You don't think so? Why not? There is such a thing as shapeshifters, you know. And there's something about him. I don't know. Maybe that's just something he wants people to believe. A bit of mystery is good for sales, I bet. You're wondering about the book burnings, aren't you? People tend to be superstitious in smaller places. And books hold a certain kind of power, especially to people who cannot read them. The power of language, of words and sounds given meaning. One thing symbolizing another. It is the basis of all magic. And more than that, to be completely immersed in a story can be seen as a type of illusion magic being worked upon you by the book. And so it follows that some people view books as dangerous. Liliara of Marwatch, a noble who lived a few centuries ago, wrote in her journal. I have overread again, and today I ordered my steward to lock my books away, lest I should live only in the pages of my next obsession and neglect my husband and son completely. I am now on a strict budget of one novel a week, and no more. But I cannot deny myself this pleasure completely of living other lives, seeing other places, if only in my mind. Furthermore, it is my belief that a reader should be left alone and not spoken to for at least a few hours after they close their book, for the mind of a reader is far away and should not be brought back to mundane matters too abruptly. Liliara saw both the pleasures and dangers of reading. Others have been more condemning. But on the whole, declamations of the dangers of reading are good for sales. Whenever a book is banned by some authority or other, the sales go through the roof. Cities like Withera and Baran, and Anessa as well, are lined with bookstores, most often frequented by students and collectors, but everyone buys a book now and then. And poets are as famous as nobles and royalty, some of them at least. The classic works of literature are in high standing everywhere. No one would dream of banning songs from the Valley of Thorns, Be Still My Heart, or prophecies of the blind ash tree. They are part of our collective memory, 
our national identity. And most of us know at least a few passages by heart. When Anthar of the White Staff, priest of Yura, was invited into the writing chamber of Ferlan the Bard and saw, with his own eyes, the first scribblings that would eventually become the rituals of the unborn. He was horrified. He wrote about it afterwards in a collection of essays which were published posthumously. I have it right here, somewhere. Here it is, dog-eared and annotated, like everything in my own private collection. Those verses of pure perfection that I had memorized since childhood, the stanzas that had comforted me during many a dark time and stood for me as the immaculate conception of divine genius. I saw them now in a raw and chaotic form as scribbles on tissue paper crossed out, changed and scribbled down again as if their words were alterable at the author's pleasure as if they could have been otherwise. An anthar of the white staff vowed never to enter the workshop of a great writer again. Perhaps we do idolize them too much, our greatest works of literature. We forget that they did not spill from the author's pen, complete and in their final form, but was molded and changed, perhaps for years, before the first copy was ever sold. Well, I'm going to bed, with a good book. You can take your pick from anything in my carriage, of course, but do it at your own risk. Read before sleep, and the world of the book might enter your dreams. Good night. Something I've been meaning to talk to you about for a few days now, or since we met in Anessa, actually, since you asked if you could join my crossing. I have this idea, a plan, but it's a bit uh, risky. And it's safer with two people. I was hoping for a companion, for safety. We can watch each other's back. Today is the fifth day of the crossing, which means that tonight we'll reach Landsong. The halfway point. The caravan will stay there for one day and two nights to let the animals rest. 
and for people to make repairs to their carriages if any is needed. And that's the only time during this crossing when we have the opportunity to, I want to say, sneak away like we're doing something illegal. Explore, I guess. Leave the rest stop and the road. Look, I understand that you're skeptical after everything I've told you about the desert and you've seen the burned ones now, more than once. But please let me explain, then you can decide. The long and short of it is, um, I need money. I've been struggling for a while, and the crossing itself is expensive. I cannot even pay Bruno this time, unless I sell my horses when we reach Withera, and then I'll be stuck there with all my stock in the carriage. Oh, don't look at me like that. It's not like I want to sell Rustler and Woodsmoke. They've been my companions for many years. Being a bookseller is uh, not very lucrative. Unless you sell to collectors, rare editions, magic scrolls, anything old and unaccounted for, that's what brings in the cash. I've had a nose for it, and so far I've also been quite lucky. I've managed to dig up some rare books now and then. Enough to make ends meet and then some. I go to auctions or estate sales. And sometimes people come to me offering some old collection they've inherited and aren't interested in keeping. But lately, my luck have run dry. I've had to rely on regular sales, and it just isn't enough. I need to find something valuable to sell. Anything ancient from the desert would be valuable. I could sell it to the researchers at Landsong, for example. They have their own excavation sites but they also buy from others who explores the desert. No, there aren't many of them. It's dangerous to leave the road, and anything close enough to be seen from the road has long since been robbed clean, I'm sure. But I found a lead, something worth looking into at least. A few miles east of Landsong, there's an area called Sundered Hills, made up of canyons, ravines, rock formations that are half buried in the sand. According to Ravani, there is a structure there. She calls it the Temple of the Serpent. This is how Ravani describes it. The canyon coiled through the cliffs like it was the trail of a giant serpent marking the way to its own temple. The reddish rock, steep and rugged, narrowed and widened 
as I progress through it. The invisible snakes breathing seemingly made the rock wall expand and contract. The ravine must have been the refuge of many small critters in need of shade and water. But water there was not, and vultures circled above me as I carefully explored. Many must have met their end here, but the watchful eyes above would leave no trace of it for the next visitor. I pressed on, a tiny creature in the immensity of the desert. I felt like a bug, like one of the glistening blue beetles scuttling across the sand, ignorant of the giant creatures surrounding it. And then, the canyon opened up and ended all at once. I entered a circular, bowl-shaped hollow, and the end of the ravine. I was standing in the head of the snake, and before me was the entrance to its temple. Ravani goes on to describe two statues with human bodies and snake heads holding staffs standing on each side of a stone door filled with symbols. She says she found a few trinkets close to the door that might have some value for a collector gathered them up and left the way she came, and that's it. I have found no more writings on the Temple of the Serpent by Ravani or anyone else I know of. It's a nice passage in her autobiography, but that's all. I never really considered to go looking for this place, until my luck finally turned and I got my hands on something very unusual. It was just a few days before you showed up at my market stall, a very warm afternoon, just before sunset. Count Aryam of Brennan himself approached me. He carried with him a small box containing the remains of a private collection, badly damaged by fire. You might have heard of the mansion that burned to the ground. One of the new ones, built along the Turan River. Yes, it was all over the papers, Ariam's son had the mansion to himself for a week, and he threw a big party, of course. He is a teenager and rich. And in a drunken stupor, he or one of his drinking buddies managed to light the curtains on fire. Instead of trying to put out the fire, or call for help, they ran away, all the way back to town, and his family's summer mansion was lost to the flames. That mansion had a library, a small private collection of old manuscripts. I suspect it was kept more to show off 
than out of any genuine interest in literature or history. The Count brought me what little was left and wanted nothing for it. He was just clearing out the remains from the ashes, he said, and thought the ones that was at least partially readable might be of some interest to someone. Most of it wasn't readable at all, except for a few lines here and there. It was too charred from the fire, But there was this one book. This one. And we must handle it very carefully. It's handwritten. Someone's notebook or diary. I think it might have been Ravani's. Or someone following in her footsteps. It took me a while to realize that. On some pages, you can read almost everything. On others, just a word here and there. But it was enough for me to recognize locations from Ravani's autobiography. The notes are rough and sometimes abbreviated. It's a very different beast than her other book. Not meant to be read by anyone else. Like this entry, for example. Day 21. Climbed the hill today. Spotted ruins to the southwest. Mapping Canyon, ALS again. I don't know what that means. There are lots of short little entries like that. Sketches as well, of statues, monoliths, engravings. Little repeated patterns that looks like the kind of decorative border you can see on pottery. And this person, whether it was Ravani or someone else, was certainly serious about their research. There is a page here about the similarities between writings on the walls of a ruin and modern Galilean hieroglyphs. The author thinks the Galilean language might be a descendant of the language of the people who lived in the desert long ago. If that is true, Galilean might be used as a tool to decipher writing found in the desert. Can you imagine what someone might pay for that? If this journal is telling the truth, it will make me rich. And you too, if you help me. There is a page that has the word land song written at the bottom of a crudely drawn map. Do you see this uh, snake-like shape? It could be the canyon Ravani describes. And if we turn the page, a sketch of a stone door with symbols on it and snake-headed statues on each side. The note says, The oxen pulls the cart. The snake slithers through grass. The sun bakes in the sky. The master sits 
on his throne and a sequence four, two, one, three. It's a riddle. A quote from another book, I think. It tells us how to open the door. There are more notes about this place. Cannot exit the same way. Must climb. Snakes inside. Scrolls and oculary. Oculary. I think that's a sort of observatory where you can study the stars? I wonder if we can find this place. If we can open that door. Will you come with me? If not, I will go alone. I cannot let this chance pass me by. You can sleep on it, but I'll set out early tomorrow. With or without you. We only have the one day. I think we can do this. Sleep on it. And give me your answer tomorrow. According to the map, this should be the right ravine. It certainly is narrow and twisty. The temple could be buried in sand by now, but Ravani found it, and it's not that many years ago. This is an old trail, right? You can just about see it. You would think the desert is empty, but behind the biggest dunes there could be cliffs, ravines like this one, and ruins, protected from the heat and the worst of the wind must be why the trail is still visible. Did you notice the dead bushes? Gods only know how old they are, but this place had life once, and water. It must have been green and lush at some point. Now there's just the vultures up above, probably keeping a close eye on us, in case we keel over. How are you holding up? Hmm. Let me know if you start to feel faint. And remember to take a good sip of that water skin now and then. I don't want you to have a sunstroke out here. I can't carry you all the way back. At least we're in the shade now. Let us see where this trail leads us.
do you see that? Footprints. And they must be recent. Footprints don't last long in the desert. I wonder if the Vitheran scholars beat us to it. Damn it. I hope I'm wrong about that. Let's see where they lead. Look. There it is. It looks just like the sketch. Two snake-headed statues. One on each side of a rectangle that must be a door, right? They're bigger than I thought. Almost twice as big as the door. And the university has been here, I see. Let's take a closer look. They've left some equipment behind. A table, lanterns, shovels and pickaxes. Look at the marks around the edge of the door. They've tried to dig their way in. It doesn't seem like they succeeded. This place might still be untouched, but I'm sure they'll be back, or they wouldn't have left their tools behind. I hope they haven't damaged the opening mechanism. The statues are very worn, but you can tell that they've been very detailed at one time. The door as well. All these little squares. Each have a different symbol. I can see a similarity to Galean. And uh, that makes me very glad that I brought this. A Galean hieroglyphic dictionary. Hopefully I can figure this out. I had this idea when I was studying the notebook that each little square is a tiny pressure plate and the riddle tells you what sequence to press them in. The oxen pulls the cart. The snake withers through grass. The sun bakes in the sky. The master sits on his throne. I have to find the symbols that makes out those phrases. And there's probably more than one symbol per phrase. I think the number sequence tells you how many. And we might only get one try. Maybe there is a way to reset the door and try again. But I have no idea how to do that. So let's try our best to get it right the first time. Are you any good with ancient languages at all? No. That's a shame. History, language, and literature overlap in most universities, all part of the humanities. So I thought maybe you'd studied a bit of a... No, it's all right. It's not like I prepared you for this. 
I'm just glad you decided to come along. Don't feel bad because you don't know some proto galian symbols. Why don't you just um, sit down in the shade over there and drink some more water and I'll work on this for a little while. Many hieroglyphs become simpler over time. They used to be more complicated. Hmm, I could look for the stems, the most important lines in each. If this is the oxen, and that might be an older version of the cart. And the oxen pulls the cart. First number was four. Four pressure plates for this one. That could fit, because there are two squares with oxen on them. The word pull could also be struggle or work or strain. That could be this one. And that's the one that most closely resembles um, the modern symbol for cart. But which oxen goes first? The big one or the small one? Wait, what's that? Another symbol on one of the oxens, almost worn away completely. It could be the number one. I guess that's it then, the first sequence. One. sequence where four, two, one, three. So the next phrase should consist of two pressure plates. The snake withers through grass. It must be snake and grass then. This one and this one, both wavy patterns. And it is all so worn. But I think this one is the snake. It seems to have a sort of head. Snake first then. And grass. I wish something here indicated whether or not I've made a mistake. The next one is easy, at least. Only one symbol. The sun bakes in the sky, and there is only one sun, so it must be this. Three down, one to go. Three symbols. For the master sits on his throne, so master combined with sit or rest and throne. I don't know a symbol for master. And the dictionary is no help. There 
is one for king, but there is nothing on the door that even remotely looks like it. The only symbol I can see that stands for anything like a leader is this one, the symbol for a deity, a god. There is a seat with a half sun over it and a symbol for sleep or rest. The later symbol means something like sitting down, taking a break. But does a master rest when on his throne? Does he not work when he sits on his throne, performing his function? Well, I don't see that I have any other alternative other than a blind guess. All right, here goes nothing. Deity, sit, I hope, and throne. Yes. The door, it's opening. Get over here. A hallway. It disappears into the darkness. Are you ready for this? Do you still want to uh, go inside? We can turn around. Suddenly I'm not so keen on doing this alone, but it's up to you. Thank you. You're a good friend. I, am. Um, I brought a couple of ghost lights. Small orbs that hover close to the last person to touch them. Emits a pale blue light, lasts a couple of hours, here, one for you and one for me, just tap it, and it will start to glow and hover. That's it. Let's go inside. Temple of the Serpent, Ravani called it, and apparently not just because of the statues. Just, um, take it slow, and try not to step on any of them. Leave them alone, and they will leave you alone. Probably.
the door closed. The notes did say we couldn't exit the same way. Damn. So far, the notebook has been correct on everything. And it did mention another way out. There is something else. I didn't mention it before because it was so cryptic. And just something small scribbled in the margins. I needed a magnifying glass to be able to read it. It said, Beware the sand diver. She knows the way. But, and the rest was illegible. I have no idea what a sand diver is. A female creature. Animal or magical. We'll have to trust our amulets. Do you think the snakes are poisonous? I have no idea myself. I don't know much about snakes. And I can't even see them properly in this light. I know that snakes hide from the midday heat and comes out at night. Kind of like the burned ones. They must have lived here for a long time and have their own ways in and out of the temple to go hunting at night. Maybe they were brought here long ago and managed to survive on their own. Or they were already here when the temple was built. If you worship snakes, Why not do it in a place where their kind already thrives? How deep do you think this goes? The blue light is so airy. Maybe the lanterns would have been better. Look at the carvings on the walls. This is not writing, it's images, frescoes almost, and so well preserved. I am being careful. Hmm. Look at this one. People harvesting reeds from a river, collecting it in baskets, carrying it to a building. Oxen plowing a field, people fighting, or dancing. Sacrificing something in front of that figure again. The deity with the head of a snake. Look at all the decorative borders. Using leaves and flower patterns. And there are palm trees in every image. Can you imagine this area as Riverland? Let's continue. I think the hallway is about to open up. I 
I was right. Look. This is a pretty big room, with benches on the floor, laid out like pews, all pointing towards another statue, snake-headed. Are those rubies in its size? I wonder how much those would be worth. We cannot even see the ceiling. The ghost light doesn't reach it. What? Did you find something? Niches along the wall. Let me take a look. Those are burned ones, lined up in all the niches along the wall. They seem immobile, inactive. Let's try to be quiet. Look at their eyes. They usually glow orange, but now, there's nothing. It's like they're turned off. I wonder if they will wake up when the sun sets outside. It's hard to tell time in here, but it was about midday. When we entered, we should still have about six hours of daylight. If they all awake at once, the amulets are efficient against the burned ones. They won't come too close, I think, unless these are somehow different from the burned ones we met outside. But let's not push our luck. I'm not taking anything from this room. And not even the rubies. Wait. Did you hear that? from over there. Yes, I do feel like we're being watched, but I thought it was the burned ones that made my skin crawl. Let's move a little bit closer and, if it's hostile, we cannot run away anyway. There's nowhere to run, is there? closed behind us. But we have to do something. So let's check it out. Carefully. The 
was nothing here. Did it just disappear? Hang on. Over here. Cleverly hidden behind a column. And very narrow. It just looked like another shadow. But it is a narrow side passage. The sand diver is showing us the way. Just like the notebook said. Come on. Slowly and carefully. is widening. I think there's another room up ahead. I was right. A small circular room. <laughs> this this makes it all worth it. Don't you see it? The shelves lining the other wall. They're divided into small, square compartments. It's the kind of shelves that was used to store scrolls before bookbinding was invented. And there's something in them. In fact, they look well stocked. Wait. Don't go in yet. Let's get an overview of the room before we enter it. Do you see the small pedestal? It looks like a sort of control panel. There's sand on the floor. And the ceiling is curved with interlaying panels. Yes, exactly. The roof opens up. We have our way out. If we can only figure out how to work it. Ravani must have left this way. Well, someone has at least, or there wouldn't be sand on the floor. There's even a narrow staircase over there, leading up one wall. So it must have been meant as an exit. Or maybe it's for maintenance. So if we can figure out how to use the control panel and the contraption still works, we can just uh, walk out. It probably closes on its own after a little while, like the door did. So before we open it, Let's take a look at the scrolls. If they are too fragile, we might have to leave them behind. If they start falling apart as soon as we touch them, it's better to leave them be. But if that is the case, I I might still copy a little bit from some of them so we don't leave empty-handed.
Some are pretty fragile, but others seem to be in a pretty decent shape. I also brought some cloth to wrap a few of them in. I'll bring a handful of the ones that seem the most intact. I also found this. It was lying in one of the shelves. A gold scarab with little precious stones on its wings. Yes, it looks like the blue beetles we've seen now and then. Almost as big as my hand. Amazing craftsmanship. Intricate. But unlike the statues, the details are perfectly preserved. It's not worn at all. It has been well protected here. If you want to keep it, it's yours. The scrolls are valuable enough, and whatever they sell for, I'll split it with you. 50-50, you have my word. But we could sell the scarab too. I'll leave that decision up to you. So, the control panel, it doesn't really look like it should be working, it's long since corroded I think, the markings on it are more like grooves, they seem to correspond to the markings on the floor, the part we can see anyway. There's a lever here as well. I think the lever opens the ceiling. And the control panel aligns whatever used to be on the floor to the night sky. How I can be so certain? Well, I'm not certain, am I? It's like the door. It just seems to make sense. And when you're not sure, you just have to pick something. Take a chance. Let's try the lever. I know this place is dangerous, I know. But we haven't encountered any traps. No poison arrows or pitfalls triggered by stepping on the wrong tile. The door was the main defense, I bet, preventing anyone but the initiated from entering. And perhaps the burnt ones, but, well, they're hard to interpret. So unless you want to look for another secret passage, I'm pulling the lever. I'm pulling it. Told you so. <laughs> Come on, let's get out of here.
Oh, we're not in the ravine anymore. Looks like we're on the top of a dune. And the ravine? You can just about see it over there. So land song must be that way. Yes, you can see that as well. Just, um, you can glimpse the buildings. See? It's good to be out of the temple. The sun is lower than I thought, but we should make it back to Lansong well before dark. Let's get a move on. The heat is unbearable. She's trying to pull us under. Keep running. Don't fall behind. And don't let her mess with your mind. Come on. Creature 
it has for its defense the violence and power of the whole ocean to which it has entrusted its being, its going, and its will. But here rise the stubborn continents, the shelves of gravel and the cliffs of rock break from water boldly into air that dry, terrible outer space of radiance and instability where there is no support for life. And now, now the currents mislead and the waves betray, breaking their endless circle to leap up in loud foam against rock and air. Breaking. What will the creature made all of sea drift do on the dry land of daylight? What will the mind do each morning waking? Some sort of illusion magic, I suppose. The dunes behind me seemed untouched. I couldn't even see my own footprints. I had no idea where to look for you, and the tracking stone didn't work for some reason. They usually have a pretty big range, several miles, but it was just dead, like you were too far away to register. So I ran back to Landsong to get help. I came back with a few Witheran guards from the college outpost and the dragon merchant. He was the one who found you. I swear he's got more than a bit of magic in him. And his strength was, yes, draconic. He knew exactly where to dig. You must have been buried in the sand foam more than an hour when he pulled you out. We were sure you were dead, but you were still breathing, somehow, 
and your hair and clothes were wet, like you'd been swimming. What happened to you? Do you remember? The sand diver sang to you and pulled you underwater. She made the sand seem like water to you. But you were really soaking wet and cool, not warm at all. Do you know what the sand diver reminds me of? A siren luring you, capturing you, pulling you under brings to mind all of Ravani's water and ocean metaphors. Maybe there is something to them. If this place had water once and went through some sort of magic induced transformation. No, that's too far fetched. Nothing has that much power. Hmm. This place. It's gotten under my skin, I think. I want to know more, to explore. The caravan, they're long gone. You've been unconscious for three days. Yes, we're still in Lansong, on the premises of the College of Ithera. The outpost has grown a lot just since last year. There were no proper medical facility here then. But now, there's a handful of healers here, and more mages than before. They're exploring more than I thought they would. It's very organized, actually. I sold them the notebook showed them how to open the door. It's okay. It's not like we're going back there. And you need proper majors to understand how that place works. They were kind enough to make a copy for me. So, I still have all the information as well. I even managed to read some of the badly burnt parts. And they paid me enough to pay Bruno. He was worried as well, but mostly about money, I think. So I paid my fare. All of it. With the money I got for the notebook. And the caravan left. The university bought the scrolls as well. I couldn't interpret anything on them. But I kept the gold scarab for you. I know I've talked about money a lot. But that's not all I care about, you know. I care about you. And the only reason I've been struggling financially is because I chose to follow my passion, to do what I love. Literature is my passion. Reading, collecting, hunting for rare manuscripts, discovering forgotten stories, learn about the past, and see the world through the eyes of people that are long gone. The desert is full of lost stories. If I want to reveal some of them 
and I do, then I need allies. You and me, exploring the ruins alone, were insanely dangerous. The University of Ithera has offered me a deal, and they've been more than fair. I think they like my riddle-solving abilities. They have some suggestions for interesting sites to visit, with mages and protection, and plenty of equipment. A proper excavation team. Some of the locations are close to Landsong, some nearer with Era. I'll be a sort of freelancer, I guess. They can hire me whenever they need my skill, on one project at a time, so I get to keep my freedom, for the most part. And if I discover something on my own, they'll pay me well for it. I think this will be good, and you can be a part of it, if you like, you and me, equal partners. It's not without danger, but it's a lot safer than the two of us going it alone. Think it over, we'll be here for a few more days at least. Then we can join the university's own caravan. Yes, they winter in with Thera too. The desert storms are at their worst in winter. But we can return in spring. And explore more ruins with them. I'm still discussing the details of the agreement. But yeah, it's good. A good partnership. You need to rest. I'm leaving you some books to read. Ravani's autobiography, because you didn't quite finish it. Songs from the Valley of Thorns. Because it's your book. And this one. Sailing the Ocean of Tears. It's about exploration as well. I think you'll enjoy it. But first, try to get some more sleep. I'll check in on you soon.